Hello and welcome to WaveScan, the international DX program from Adventist World Radio. Researched and written in Indianapolis by Dr. Adrian Peterson and produced in the studios of WRMI in Okeechobee, Florida. I'm Jeff White. Today on WaveScan, over the years with PWI, the USA and Europe. A book review of the International Shortwave Broadcast Guide. We'll have DX News from Bangladesh, and our special QSL of the week is a short-term jamming transmission. Well, in our continuing series of topics regarding the shortwave stations operated by PWI, Press Wireless International, this time we look at the wartime years over in Icelandic and continental Europe. During this era, the Press Wireless factory on Long Island, quite near to their shortwave transmitter station at Hicksville, manufactured many shortwave transmitters at various power levels, including their now famous 40 kilowatt unit, as well as their low-powered mobile units. Ray Robinson of KVOH has the story. Yes, Jeff. Some of these PWI transmitters were shipped to England and subsequently to continental Europe by both Navy and commercial vessels, usually with each consignment split and conveyed on different ships. In this way, if some ships were sunk by enemy submarine attacks, only a partial consignment was lost, not a complete consignment of all the electronic equipment. It's known that at least one mobile station was lost in 1944 due to enemy action, and that station still lies to this day on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. Actually, Press Wireless began their European operations in 1932 with the opening of an office in Paris, France, and the lease of transmitting and receiving facilities from the French PT&T authorities in nearby country areas. Their Paris operation collected the news flow from other countries in Europe and fed the information to the United States via the PWI receiver station at Little Neck on the north side of Long Island, New York. As the European conflict progressed, PWI moved its European operation in the summer of 1940, first from Paris to Bordeaux on the Atlantic coast in southwest France, and then to Tours, almost in the centre of France, and finally into Vichy, France, though that location was soon afterwards closed. Towards the end of the war, PWI again began sending shipments of radio equipment from the United States, beginning early in 1944. The first of the 40-kilowatt PWI SSB transmitters to arrive on the other side of the Atlantic was installed at Lingfield, with the receiver station at Swanley Junction, both in Surrey, to the south of London. The purpose for this station was to establish communication circuits with the United States. Two more of these 40 kilowatt transmitters were transported to England, and the teams of technical radio personnel associated with the units received their training on a similar unit located at PWI Hicksville. In 1944, the technical equipment and personnel were taken by ship to the British Isles. One ship in use for this purpose was the ex-passenger liner Mauritania, which travelled across the Atlantic alone, without convoy. It was considered to be a fast ship that could outrun any other seafaring vessels that might be in pursuit. The equipment was landed in Scotland and taken south by road. The radio personnel installed one of these PWI transmitters at an army camp located at Stowe-on-the-Wold in Gloucestershire, some 75 miles northwest of London. The transmitter was used for two purposes. One was to broadcast fake communication transmissions that would give the impression that the invasion of continental Europe under what became D-Day would take place in Calais, or perhaps even in Norway, instead of the intended Normandy. And the other purpose was for army communications back to the United States. After D-Day and the subsequent liberation of Paris, the PWI team landed in France and began work on the installation of the other unit at Les Essartes, an outer suburb of Paris. Originally, this 40 kilowatt PWI transmitter was planned to be installed at Rennes in France. However, with the progress of events at the front line, the more advanced location of Les Essartes was chosen. The electronic equipment for this station was delivered in a thousand crates and boxes, and it was reassembled in 25 days by 45 personnel. 
This transmitter facility was installed in buildings commandeered for the purpose and the receiver station was located in an old farmhouse further down the same road. Power came from three Cummings diesel generators and rhombic antennas were beamed on the United States for communication with PWI Hicksville, New York. This new and rather substantial shortwave station was activated in September 1944. A photo at the entranceway to the station shows the call sign as CZ2T, though it identified on air simply as Radio Paris. The main purpose for this PWI station in Paris was to relay news items and news commentaries from Chaif, that is, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, back to the United States for insertion into programming from the Voice of America. On several occasions, international radio monitors in the United States, New Zealand and Australia noted PWI Hicksville and Paris in communication with each other for the transfer of radio news items. For example, in March 1945, Radio Paris, CZ2T, was noted on 15920 kHz with a program relay to the United States. And in September, this station was noted on 15293 kHz with program inserts for the NBC Blue Network. In the reverse direction, PWI Hicksville was noted calling Chafe Paris on several occasions. The Hicksville channel call signs at the time were WPJ on 11640 kHz and WJQ on 10010 kHz. Apparently somebody in the radio world had an insight into the workings of PWI Paris because in September 1945 a column editor in Australia stated that the permanence of this station was doubtful. However, the story does not end here. In addition to the single 40 kilowatt PWI transmitter at Les Essart, there were a number of other transmitters, maybe even 15 or more. And one of these was a 10 kilowatt shortwave broadcast transmitter that was installed in a subsidiary building at the Les Essart station, and it was for the relay of radio programming from Radio Diffusion Francaise in Paris. The main coverage area from this unit was intended to be Europe and Africa. As far as is known, this transmitter operated on only one channel, either 9560 or maybe 9550 kHz. The programming was always a relay from Paris, and often in parallel with shortwave transmitters at other locations. The station was often heard in the United States, and sometimes in Australia and New Zealand. It was also listed in several early editions of the World Radio Handbook. It appears that the power of the French shortwave broadcast station at Les Essart was raised from 10 kilowatts to 100 kilowatts somewhere around 1947. It's possible that the power level of the 40 kilowatt transmitter was also raised in the era after peace was resumed in Europe and after the American personnel had returned to their homeland. So there you have it. This PWI shortwave station located on the edge of suburban Paris was on the air with news for newspapers and voice reports for radio and TV stations in the United States, as well as with program relays for rebroadcast by the Voice of America. And in addition, this shortwave station operated as a relay station for the international shortwave service of Radio Diffusion Francaise. And we'll have more about PWI in Europe on another occasion. Listening to WaveScan from Adventist World Radio. Send your comments and reception reports to WaveScan, Box 29235, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46229, in the United States. That's WaveScan, Box 29235, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46229, in the USA. Or you can email us at WaveScan at awr.org Our email once again wavescan at awr.org A most remarkable shortwave book at a most remarkable price is the winter 2014-2015 edition of the comprehensive volume International Shortwave Broadcast Guide by Gail Van Horn at Teak Publishing in Brasstown, North Carolina. This twice-annual volume, now the third in this series, contains almost 500 pages of valuable and interesting information about shortwave broadcasting. Gail Van Horn asks the question, 
So why should you listen to shortwave radio? Quite simply, she answers, because shortwave radio is your window to the world. Throughout the world, shortwave remains the most readily available and affordable means of mass communication and information. It lets you listen to voices from around the world. Shortwave radio provides nearly instantaneous coverage of news and events from around the world. You can easily listen to shortwave broadcast stations located in countries all around our globe, especially if you know when to listen. That's where this new edition of the International Shortwave Broadcast Guide is particularly useful. The International Shortwave Broadcast Guide Winter 2014-2015 edition is a unique information resource that provides a 24-hour station frequency guide to all of the known stations currently broadcasting on shortwave radio at the time of publication. This tabulated information offers an hour-by-hour schedule that includes all language services, frequencies, and world target areas for each broadcast station. This new e-publication edition is an expanded version of the English Shortwave Broadcast Guide formerly printed in the pages of Monitoring Times magazine for over 20 years. This one-of-a-kind e-book is now published twice a year to correspond with station seasonal time and frequency changes. It is a splendid radio adventure to peruse each page in the current edition of the International Shortwave Broadcast Guide. For example, the first chapter provides us with interesting information all about shortwave radio. These entries are followed by hints on accessing the international and tropical shortwave bands, together with suggestions regarding the usage and availability of suitable shortwave radio receivers. The comprehensive and uniquely complete listening guide is set out hour by hour in UTC, International Radio Timings, with the shortwave stations listed in alphabetical order of country. If you want to listen to the world, here is your opportunity. All of the nearly 400 pages of tabulated listings are sprinkled here and there with a reproduction in color of an exotic QSL card from a shortwave station somewhere on planet Earth. Towards the end of the current edition of the International Shortwave Broadcast Guide, you'll find a listing of all current DX programs on the air on shortwave, including WaveScan, with all of its many timings. The final section of this fascinating ebook tells us about the author, Gail Van Horn, and her illustrious radio backgrounds, together with the availability of her many other radio books, each in electronic form. The International Shortwave Broadcast Guide, Winter 2014-2015 edition, is now available for purchase worldwide from Amazon.com at www.amazon.com. The price for this latest edition is just a little under five U.S. dollars. Remarkable. And remember, too, that frequency updates between editions are posted on her Shortwave Central blog at http mt shortwave blogspot Dot com. Now, if any of you, our listeners, do not have access to the Internet, we would suggest that you contact a friend who is Internet savvy and ask him to download this volume at such a low price on your behalf. We can confidently recommend to you the new and current International Shortwave Broadcast Guide, Winter 2014-2015 edition. It will be of real value to you in your listening to the international and tropical shortwave broadcasting bands. We might also add that this valuable compendium stands just as high in the international radio world as the annual publication World Radio TV Handbook and as the four-volume set on shortwave broadcasting and listening by Jerome Berg. Is shortwave broadcasting dead? No, not so, and far from it. Just ask those who attend the twice-yearly HFCC planning meetings and those who endeavor to locate an empty spot on the shortwave dial to insert a desired program, and those who plan and produce DX programs, and those who respond to listener reception reports and issue QSL cards. Thank you, Gail Van Horn, for your splendid service to the international shortwave world. Next on WaveScan today, let's go to Bangladesh, and here is Salahuddin Dalar with his DX report for this month. This is Salahuddin Dalar from Russia, Bangladesh, Wishing you Happy New Year 2015. 16 December 2014, the only state-owned radio station of Bangladesh, Bangladesh Betar, celebrated its 75th anniversary. 
the prime honorable prime minister of bangladesh sheikh hasina inaugurated the four day long diamond jubilee celebration program on 15th december in the celebration program there were arranged a seminar on the future of bangladesh betar and cultural program bangladesh betar also awarded those heroic radio men who played their vital role at the time of liberation war now the receiving log of different radio stations which i monitored december 9 2014 bbc at 0100 to 0130 utc in english on 15310 kilohertz the sai code was 444 china radio international at 0200 to 0230 utc in bangla on 11640 kilohertz the sai code was 555 adventist world radio at 1300 to 1330 utc in bangla on 15 to 15 kilohertz the sai code was 444 december 10 bbc at 0130 to 0145 utc in urdu on 15510 kilohertz the sai code was 444 bhutan broadcasting corporation at 0145 to 0200 utc in jonkha on 6035 kilohertz the sai code was 444 december 11th radio free asia at 0200 to 0230 utc in tibetan on 9670 kilohertz the sai code was 322 all india radio at 0223 to 0230 utc in kannada on 15120 kilohertz the sai code was 333 december 12 doise bhele at 1430 to 1500 utc in urdu on 9440 kilohertz the sai code was 333 december 13 acjb global at 1400 to 1450 utc in urdu on 11590 kilohertz the sai code was 444 Bangladesh DXT will issue EQSL card for the correct reception report. Please send your reception report to the following address: dxbangla at gmail dot com. D x b a n g a l a. Dxbangla at gmail dot com. Okay, I will come with more DX news in the next edition. Till then, take care. Salaudin Dollar, Rashahi, Bangladesh. Thank you, Salaudin. Our special QSL of the week now is a short-term jamming transmission. Thomas Drescher in Roseroth, Germany, tells us that he also has received a QSL card from a jamming transmission. Back in the 1970s, there were several pirate radio stations operating aboard ships anchored in open waters in the North Sea, with programming beamed to various countries in Atlantic and continental Europe. One of these ships was the Mebo II. with on-air programming under the identification RNI Radio Nord Sea International beamed to England and Holland though their programming at that stage was in English and German the 10 kilowatt shortwave channel for RNI was 6210 kHz though for a few days this transmitter channel was adjusted slightly to 6215 kHz the maritime radio station Radio Rogaland located towards the southern tip of Norway claimed that RNI was broadcasting on a Radio Rogaland channel and so they jammed the programming from the pirate radio ship the continuous loop tape message in English from Radio Rogaland stated this is a transmission from the Norwegian coast station Rogaland Radio operating in single sideband mode upper sideband with a carrier frequency of 6215.0 kHz The purpose of this transmission is to clear the channel of unauthorized and out-of-band broadcasting to improve reception conditions for ships wishing to communicate with coast stations on this frequency or on adjacent maritime channels. Well, Thomas Drescher sent a reception report regarding the jamming transmission to Radio Rogaland in Norway and he received a QSL in response. The handwritten QSL text was inscribed on the back of a photograph depicting two radio officers on duty at the control panels of Radio Rogaland. The QSL text 
verified the reception of Radio Rogaland on July 8, 1970. And we end today's edition of Wavescan with some folk music from Norway, from the Norwegian radio. Thanks for listening to Wavescan, international DX program from Adventist World Radio. Researched and written in Indianapolis by Adrian Peterson. Next week on Wavescan, Railway Radio in Australia, Part 1. We'll have our Australian DX report from Bob Padula. And our special QSL of the week will be the first reception report from India. Well, several QSL cards are available for this program. You can send your AWR and KSDA reception reports for Wavescan to the AWR address in Indianapolis and also to the station your radio is tuned to, WRMI or WWCR or KVOH, or to the AWR relay stations that carry Wavescan. Remember, too, you can send a reception report to each of the DX reporters when their segment is on the air from Japan, Bangladesh, the Philippines, Australia, and India. They will verify with their own very colorful QSL card. Return postage and an address label are always appreciated. The address for your reports to Wayscan is Wayscan, Box 29235, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46229, USA. That's Wavescan Box 29235, Indianapolis, Indiana 46229, USA. Our email is wavescan at awr.org. That's wavescan at awr.org. I'm Jeff White at WRMI in Okeechobee. Till next week, good listening, everyone.
Kölnens skulle till Mölna gå För en trillant rå, för en bärskan brå Fökan tjock och disen låg En trillant trå, en bärskan brå För trillant i gunnet trör och ro Kölnens borte staven så Ur en trillan trå, en bärskan brå Mejne du isen bär mig då En trillan trå, en bärskan brå För trillan ligger under trör och ro Staven han svarar kallen så För en trillan trå, en bärskan brå Gå ut på så får du sjå En trillan trå, en bärskan brå För trillan ligger under trör och ro Kallan ut på isen steg för en trillan trå, för en bärskan brå. Och isen unga kallan seik, en trillan trå, en bärskan brå, för trillan ligger under trör och ro. Kallan sak.